guys, welcome to the Auto Gypsy Garage YouTube channel. Today we're out with the Utah Cobra Club. Right now we're in Emmiston, Wyoming at the Roundhouse. It's an old train car museum. And so we're gonna kind of give you a little rundown of, uh, you know, what they're doing out here. We've never been here, so it's just gonna be kind of a shoot from your hip. You know, pull the camera out of your back pocket and get, get scrolling. So anyway, this device here, it's going to take us in a 360 degree turn and we'll be able to see all this stuff as they roll around so it's one of them they just said hold on so uh, here we go oh yeah oh it's just about as fast as the bumper cars at lagoon so it's not going to win the race but check it out guys this is so cool So here we are, um, 4420. This is the most ominous look of the of the locomotive because you're looking at the innards of a tea kettle. The pipes that fit into these holes transmit heat from the back of the locomotive to the front and surrounding each one of those tubes is all the water. The steam lives at the very, very top. Between this wall, what we call a sheet, and the other wall at the other end, the firebox end where the, where the heat is, that's the container for the, for the water. The heat just transmits through the tubes from front to back. There's different size tubes uh, there, and I'll explain that to you, but uh, the ones that create the steam in the first place are the two inch tubes. There's 133 of them. And the Federal Railroad Administration says that for any steam locomotive that is steam driven, the boiler tubes have to be replaced every 15 calendar years. Not 15, if, if you ran this five minutes, 15 years later, you'd have to do the tubes all over again. Here's my buddy Jim with his Sunbeam Tiger. Yeah. Okay, so here are the 133 tubes that we've cut out. And these are the superheater tubes that connect to that superheater box in the beginning. And you can see how they lap back and forth four times before they go back into the exit hole. If you really look at these tubes, you're looking for rust, you're gonna have a hard time finding it. It's hard to imagine. That and these have been sitting dormant since 58. How do they know rust? Right? How do they know? How do they know? Here's our brand new tubes. Yay! Truck delivered from a welding school in Oklahoma at an extreme cost. They stripped a lot of stuff off of this. They pulled the glass off the side. 
they put the, the wire mesh across here so kids wouldn't jump off of it down onto the grass. Uh, gauges were pulled, some of them were stolen, uh, and so on. Here's our brake shoes. We need replacing. So the tender, um, we like this because it's a uh, in relation, it's a great locomotive because it has a tender behind. The rivet line shows where the coal goes, and also where the water goes. This is the water tank portion of it. The ratio is two to one, water to fuel. And there were timbers under here that protected the belly of the water tank from flexing, which would put stresses on that floor. And there's some of them. How many gallons could that? 20,000 uh, of, of the water. These are 1914. And you cannot buy this wood in Home Depot. We're Lowe's. This is tough stuff. We lined all of our benches with this same wood. So we, we jacked this body up, just pulled off the bolts that hold it down and jacked it up. And then that gave us an opportunity to inspect the bottom of the tender belly. And then we decided we'd go get a water hose. Put it in the nozzle up in the top and started putting water in it. No leaks. None. 1917. So we ordered our replacement wood for it. And uh, so blast and paint, epoxy paint the bottom of it. Put the wood in, we're good to go. One of the first things we had to do was make sure the bearings were good. The bearing is a, a partial circle. It sits right on top of the axle. This is a plain bearing, not a roller bearing. So all you do is jack up the truck, putting a jack right here on, on the truck. That allows the wheel to drop. Pull out the bearing, have a look at it, mic the axle shaft, put it back in. Just pile grease around it. So the way this is lubricated, is they had cotton batting that they would use and they would cram that in there and then pour their lubrication oil into it and the oil would wick into this cotton batting which would contact the bearing surface and provide a constant lubrication so in all the eight journals there's a total of 250 t-shirts we equally divided them and packed them into the journal boxes and filled the boxes full of oil we came back a week later, and all the oil is gone. Yeah, it had whipped into the t-shirts. So now we have to fill it and keep filling it until it stays right at the level here. So this is kind of like a little bathtub, holds all that oil. Oh, by the way, let's see. Los Angeles, Salt Lake, Council Bluffs. Got a whole bunch of different towns these wheels were manufactured. That's the right. On them. There you go. Once again, these these just like the tires on the locomotive are a nice straight taper. <laughs> they don't have this huge divot in the in the profile. We're good to go with wheels. 1958. Yay. So the, the people that lived in the city that worked with this locomotive said, we gotta keep this in good shape. If this breaks down, we're out of day's work or a week's work or whatever. So they really kept good care of this thing. Oh, you caught me during intermission reading up on the Holly Sniper fuel injection installation manual. Well, it says right here that before I continue my installation, I'm supposed to watch this YouTube video on how Auto Gypsy Garage meets up with six Cobras to meet up at the Roundhouse Railways in Evanston, Wyoming. I guess I do what I'm told. They extended the funnel on the tender for water. And the reason for that, I believe, is so they would have less spillage from the big boom that would deliver that water. Because spillage on a slope in the dead of winter means you might as well just go to Park City and go skiing over there because this turns into a ski slope. It just made things nice and tidy. Holding pocket to move the car that's on the next track. 
with a reverse move. Those pockets would break because they would forget to undo the brakes. So they outlawed this after World War II. This is where the pulley pole used to sit. This is where the re-railer would sit. It's a triangulated piece. It sits on the track. It's got a groove in it. It allows the locomotive engineer and his, his fireman to get a car right back onto the rails without using a crane. So this wedge shape here is where the coal would be dumped. And the fireman, of course, would shovel that coal into the into the door in the, in the, in the back end there and load it in. Over here. We found a tag on it that said it was re rebuilt just a few years before it was retired. We were licking our chops going, yeah, that's really cool. So we pulled the heads off, looked at the valve system, looked at the piston cylinders, everything looked really good, oiled it, put it back together. It's ready to be tested. So steam goes in one side of this, operates piston, that operates then the cold side, takes in outside air, compresses it, goes into the air tanks, one on each side, and that air runs all the brakes for the whole train, as well as all the other air functions for the locomotive. This is the gas pedal. Engineer's got a long rod, operates a 90 degree lever, and lifts this piston and the cylinder. It's got two ceiling surfaces. These are hand lapped together so that they close exactly at the same time and seal off the steam around it from going into the front of the locomotive where it's eventually delivered to the to the drive cylinders. This is the reverser. This is the mechanically operated device that moves all the linkages. Its movement goes from here to there. And that's at the other end of this huge quadrant Johnson bar. It's got the bicycle grip on it. It has nine teeth per inch to give infinite control of this. We've got this all done. This set outside the nose cone in the front in the weather and became rusted, nicked, pitted, damaged like nobody's business. But the bottom line is the cylinder inside is in real nice condition. And so we had this spun on the leg, hot metal spray, resurface it on a leg. I could do repair and crankshaft. And there it sits ready to install. You just need the rubber seals to go to the piston ring inside. This controls a lever that changes what happens with this reciprocating lever here. This thing pivots here, as I demonstrated on the other side. It goes back and forth. So if you think about that reverser, that piston position decides whether or not the rod that sits in this slot comes up, slot, and goes forward, or goes down the slot and goes in reverse, plus that percentage of steam that we want at the piston. So a whole lot of steam injection is here, less is up the slot going this way. So we're changing the phasing of the valve in steam injection in order to go in reverse by, by pulling it or, or pushing it in relationship to the position of the side rod here. What you usually see on, on the, the wheel set that operates this is there's an eccentric lever that travels differently than the wheel does. It travels in the same direction, but as it's attached, it might be instead of aiming at the center here, it's aiming over here. And then that connects to this valve timing. And so you take that reciprocating motion, change its phase in relationship to the wheels to determine whether the injection is, is going to work to enhance reverse motion or forward motion. It moves quite a bit, but we can take and modify how much the effective movement is by using this reverser and its function of percentage control of the steam. And that's really cool to see.
if you study the valve, the, the Walshart's valve movement, when a steam locomotive is operating, you get to see all this stuff in action. It's just, just like a group of people all trying to run towards each other, just moving all over. It took me about three weeks to polish up those two piston lines. But if you look at them, they're not pitted. There's a few little tiny nicks in it that are in the unused portion, but there must have been six or seven coats of heavy duty paint on those things. And it was crocus cloth and lacquer thinner, getting all that to dissolve and get it down to the metal to inspect the metal because we didn't know what was under the paint. But they turned out pretty good. John's been working on the valve, polishing up the valve piston rods. And uh, these were done, I did those about a year ago. I knew what I was doing every day when I came to work. <laughs> and huge roll of crocus cloth too. So I'd get back three, four feet yeah. and run that. How long is your work day when you show up? You're not going to believe this. We work two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Nine to noon. All right, let's go around to the front and we'll finish this up. You got to stay with me on this one. This is this is uh, this is delivering steam to the wheels. Those tubes are 12 feet long. It's a little longer than the distance between the front sheet and the rear sheet. So some of the tube, when they install it, protrudes. So first of all, the holes are actually bigger than the outside of the tubes. So the tubes are set in place and there's a tool that goes in and expands that tool, uh, that tube tight to the hole it's sitting in. And that provides the seal to keep the seam where it is. Then, after that's done, the end of the tube that's protruding is, is um, rolled around in a bead towards the outside 180 degrees so that the end of that bead contacts the surface of the sheet. They do that at both ends. Then in the firebox, because of the intense heat that's in there, they take that bead and then they weld it right to the sheet surface so we don't get any escaping of the heat along that seam or expanding any of that seam because the seam is tight and sealed. In the front, we do the swedging and the beading. We don't weld it because the boiler does this. It expands and contracts. And if those were welded end to end, there would be no ability of those pipes to keep up. Or they would keep up for a while, but there'd be stresses in that metal that would eventually cause them to rupture there's the explosion we're talking about. If we look at, at the very, very top, right above that white box there, you'll see a couple of nuts that are holding a flange. It's a huge pipe. Well, that comes from that valve that I showed you over there. That's the steam delivery that's coming along that pipe, and that flange delivers that steam into that white box. The reason it's white is because that's the second step of a die check for cracks. The initial color is, is red. We let that soak into any cracks. And we put the contrast color over that so that the red can bleed through and show us where there's any cracks within that piece. So it's twice baked potato. We take hot, wet steam and superheat it and turn it into dry steam. Now we've got a lot more steam pressure, which makes our fuel efficiency greater. Well, Jake, that wasn't too bad of a little ditty. You know, the, the curator, he's not normally the curator. He, his name's Steve. He, uh... Steve! Steve! <laughs> he actually was kind of fun and quirky. You know, he, ah, doing weird things and blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm trying to be cute and funny. And he's uh, basically the, a volunteer that goes down there and does all this restoration work kind of on a volunteer basis and I guess the normal curator wasn't there and so they had Steve step in and I thought he did a great job. I figured he was yeah. the guy. Right. You know. Yeah. But 
you know, trying to film all that, get all the different angles and in and out. God, my shoulders were just burning. I'm dying over there. You know, I got to pick my nose and ah, you know, stepping in front of everybody. And that's the car show videos, man. When we're filming those burnouts and stuff, my arms are just ah, you're down, you're up, you're down, you're up, your necks go. You just you're by the end. You're like, please stop. But we try to capture some cool stuff and make it, you know, more than one camera angle, and that's what we, you know, we're trying to get better at it. Yeah. So I hope you know everyone likes what they saw. And if they have any comments, we'd love to hear back from the people because we don't know what we're doing at all. This is a totally new area. We build cars and go fast. We don't do videos. <laughs> you know, we're trying. We're all just winging it from the hip. We have no clue what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, but if you like what you see, you know, like and subscribe to our videos. It, you know, we're trying to get monetized. As soon as we are, we're going to give away a thousand dollars in cash to we're going to pick one out of the hat so you know until we get to that moment it's just cost us time and money and effort and it's really hard to stick with it because yeah. you really don't get anything out of this for a long time right but uh, perseverance wins the race and we're definitely racers yeah. so pedal down <laughs> until next time auto gypsy out